With all this coronavirus nonsense, governments have ceased to govern. It's not the only issue. And if we let people get on with their lives, look after themselves and protect the elderly and the vulnerable, we might have time to make some important decisions about critical issues. Saturday was World Population Day. The projected figures make your head spin. Global population is expected to hit 11 billion by 2100. Forget that figure. With our current growth rates, we're on our way to 100 million. What happens to our energy reserves? Simple market economics means the price of electricity will go up when pensioners are already turning off their heating in winter. Think of the unemployment levels come September. Pre-coronavirus, we had over 12% youth unemployment and 18% underemployment. Many young people can't get a job. And with automation and robotics, there'll be fewer and fewer jobs. Not one major political party has any plan for any of this population issue. A quarter of Sydney apartments are now occupied by families. They can't afford a house. Think what this means for children. Whether you're in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, the Gold Coast, entire suburbs are being rezoned for apartments. People living like battery hens. The New South Wales government's talking about 700,000 units in blocks of up to 25 storeys. And this is where the so-called coronavirus cluster is in Melbourne. Think about it. Cooped up in an apartment for six weeks. Just like Sydney, the New South Wales government is talking about 35,000 new dwellings accommodating 150,000 residents. That's just for South West Sydney. That will require 40 new schools, 177 new hospital beds, seven new ambulance stations, six new fire stations, five new police stations, 15 new libraries and 22 long day care centres. New. We're kidding, aren't we? All because of population growth. These are suburbs in Sydney where every single street is being zoned for high-rise of up to 25 storeys. In some suburbs, children are being educated in high-rise. Businesses on the bottom, classrooms on the top. Well, you were impressed by Michael McLaren last week and he's going to be on each week at this time. This is something he has talked about. But before we go on, I promised you an extract of his academic record at Sydney University. Have a look at this. Have a look at this. Can you see it? And there it is. Distinction, high distinction, 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 high distinction, <laughs> distinction. <laughs> oh, that's just the first year. We'll whack it on the end of the second year and we see distinction, high distinction. This is Sydney University. High distinction, high distinction, high distinction. Go on, let's go to the third year. Here he is, high distinction. What happened to the credit? <laughs> this is, throw him out, throw him out. But let's go to the fourth year. He must have had some fun in the third year. And there we go, distinction, distinction. Goodness me, here he is, here he is, here he is, here he is. I mean... Good to talk to you. Did I do all that? I think you did. <laughs> no, giving away marks that year. <laughs> it's a light year. <laughs> Not enough international <laughs> students that year. <laughs> Population. You've Big talked issue. about it. Huge issue. I think it's the issue. And I think it's also the Greens' Achilles heel. Because on the one hand, as you know, Alan, they, they've never seen a refugee they didn't want to bring in, let alone the family, everybody else. And yet on the other hand, they're desperate to maintain the natural environment and whatnot. Well, you can't have it both ways. Uh, for all of those people terribly worried about the koala habitats, I am, I think everyone should be, national icon, but they happen to be in the same place we all want to live, by the coast and the nice fertile plains. So you can't both coexist. And at some point, you've got to draw the line, don't you, and ask the ultimate question, are we benefiting from all of this? And you look at record national debt, record private debt, state governments have never been in more debt, half the councils are insolvent, all at the same time we've had record population growth, is it really benefiting the average Australian or the economy? Well, I mean, almost every problem we have to face is a consequence of population growth out of control. Yes, absolutely. And Water resources, electricity yes. resources, transport, habitat, transport. Well, trans schools, overcrowding, hospitals overcrowding. I mean, eight out of ten Australians want a population plan. We're talking coronavirus. No-one is prepared to address this ever it's never an election issue. Why do you think? Because well, they know what the answer would be. Yes, that's true. They never ask you questions. That's they don't true. want you to give the answer. They know what it's going to be. I mean, if we're talking about 100 million people or 11 billion people worldwide, I think you used an excellent expression. What are all these hands going to do? Quite. Where do they get a job? I mean, automation's already yes. making its way through Southeast Asia. Africa will be the next frontier in the subcontinent. So once automation hits those economies, which happen to also be the places where the population growth rate is at its zenith. What are all these people going to do? And at the same time, there'll be stress over resources, which are scarcer there than they are here. 
I mean, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to know that potential conflict comes as a result right. of that. Now, what, what... I mean, the UN, we don't know what they do a lot of the time. They do some good. But what are they doing about this? It's is the it's... only forum you can discuss global population mm. growth. Well, Bob Carr, who's watched... Good evening to you, Bob. He'll be watching the program. He is one person who said over and over again that mm. when you talk about population, politicians look the other way, while their constituents in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and everywhere are overwhelmed by this issue. Yeah, quite. Overwhelmed. And think of the money... Having, was... a, having a child taught in a high-rise building yeah. with businesses up the top. Get the lift, go to the fourth, not to the sixth. That's where coals are. Yeah. Hey? Well, it's all going on in Parramatta, where I grew up. It is. Chatswood. And Chatswood, so. Chatswood. I mean, I'm it's also in Brisbane. I mean, yeah. if you go... I went to Queensland University and there was this beautiful sandstone building. Mm. And, and it's, we talk politics here, I suppose, but it was dyed in the wool, blue ribbon liberal. Hawk and drive, beautiful homes, St Lucia and the lot. I'll tell you what, the Liberals will struggle to get a vote. It's all high-rise, full of students everywhere, street after street after street. And we've got streets being rezoned almost entirely for high-rise. No one cares. No, they don't. But, well, no one in politics cares, no, but yeah. everyone in the street cares. Well, Tony Abbott said legal migration is now double the average of the Howard years and it's putting millions of Australians' lives under stress. He said we should scale back the rate of immigration and then he said this, sure, critics will denounce any change as populist. Isn't this lovely? Mm. Typically Abbott, he says, but that's what snobbish elites always say about something the public want, but well, they don't. In a democracy where the majority yes. should rule, what's wrong with populism? Well, quite. What's dangerous about it? Well, well, I thought that was the idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I got it wrong. Certainly. But isn't it extraordinary how they don't listen to the public? Well, it's on coronavirus and everything. I mean, Gladys and these people are giving us lectures every day. But they think we're getting rich because... Or they're getting rich. But look at the debt. Mm. I mean, we've had record population growth for, what, 20 years, right? Yes, We've yes. never had more debt, and we can't just blame the GFC or the coronavirus for that situation. The debt is largely coming from social welfare spend. Mm, and when you increase the population, That's they've got this, this crazy idea that more people will offset the pension. But and then they you've got, get old. Quite. They, they, then they, then you've got this water and energy issue. Yeah. Now, I've gone on about this forever and ever. It's rained at the weekend, rained in New South Wales. Not a cup's been harvested. But you've got to say this slowly. Can you imagine how foolish it is with increased population and water as a scarce resource that we flush the toilet Drink with the water. same water that we clean our teeth with? Now, you'd think that things like the garden and the car and the toilet could all be recycled water. Quite. And, and there's not a plan for it. No. I mean, I think you made the comment. Why do we give subsidies for people to put solar panels on their roof, but we don't provide a subsidy for anyone to have a rainwater tank? It makes no sense. No. Now, a lot of new developments, sure. Yes, the, that's right. The regulation is going to... But there's probably a million properties in Sydney alone that could be retrofitted. Mm. Existing homes don't have one. But you know there are councils, Michael, and our, our viewers would be interested in this, there are councils across Australia in new developments that demand that development have a detention, a detention tank, detention. That means they don't want the verges to be washed away by heavy rain, so the detention, the water moves, is moved, channelled into this underground detention tank, and when the rain is over and it's next week or something, you have to let it out and go into the ocean where it salinates and then they have massive desalination plants to take the salt out of it. Work that out. It's very, very hey, efficient. <laughs> I know. Well, it, look, desalinated water obviously isn't the answer. It's expensive water and it's also environmentally unfriendly water, by and large. So what you've got to do is harvest the natural stuff. Now, right. obviously, the topography isn't simple. Mm. Uh, now, in Ethiopia, they're building a new dam. They found the money. It's going to yeah. be 30-odd times the size of Warragambas. Yeah, just say that again. This is true. Ethiopia, say yeah. that again. This is yeah. Ethiopia. Oh, we laugh at Ethiopia. I mean, yeah. that bloke in the World Health Organisation has got good links with Ethiopia, but they're building a dam 30 times the size of Warragamba. Hydroelectricity off it. Quite. The Egyptians aren't happy because yeah. it's going to stuff them up with the, That's the, it. the Nile, but too bad. We don't have one. further upriver. We, we don't have one. No, we don't. But, look, they've got the topography to do it. At least they're doing it. It's not as simple here because we don't have a big valley that you can easily dam straight away. Well, We're we could use the Clarence River. There's lots of waters. There's lots of You've options. got to pipe it. Absolutely, Clarence. And, and that was a proposal put by Jack Beale in the 1950s. I was working for Malcolm Fraser. We put $10 million aside to investigate mm. uh, the Clarence River system. Bob Hawke became Prime Minister. He stopped the money and nothing's been heard of it since. Just before you go, a quick one on Hong Kong. Well, I'm in favour of bringing a Definitely. certain number of people out. They've got to be vetted, of Definitely. course. You mm. can't be too careful. Uh, but I'll speak tonight on my program to someone who's in favour of the South African farmer's plight. It's funny how 
That's gone quiet, yet their situation hasn't changed. And it doesn't matter if they're white, black or brindle. Uh, they're under enormous pressure there. And the difference, of course, with those people from South Africa who are agriculturalists is they are much more likely when they come here Quite. to move to a regional area yes. where we need new blood. Mm. We don't need new blood in Sydney no. or Brisbane or Canberra. No. It's full, basically. And let's be... But blunt. we could have the best of both worlds because well, we those could... Hong Kong people whom we would accept and there would be certain conditions are highly skilled, highly trained, highly educated, the very kind of people we need to kick-start economic recovery and drive business. Quite yeah. the mess that we're in. Equally, we need the kind of skills that the South African farmer has got and finally, I, we can't stand by, surely, and see South African farmers treated like this. Well, quite. And I can only come to the conclusion that the reason we don't really try is because of South Africa's history. Now, you and I, everyone would agree, what happened was wrong. Quite. But if it was wrong when whites did it to blacks, we it's don't. equally wrong when blacks quite. do it to whites. And we don't punish the present because of the past. That's right. And that's, <laughs> that sort of re retrospective history is ridiculous. <laughs> Well, there's the man with all the distinctions. He talks as if he's got them as well. And a credit. But the good part about it is we don't have to solve all the problems with the world tonight because you'll be back next week. I look forward to it. There you are. Good to talk to you. There